everyone. It's 11 o'clock and uh, my name is Christine Chow from KW Executive. On behalf of the Education Committee of the West San Gabriel Valley Realtors, we would like to welcome you to today's Zoom and Learn on the topic of home insurance versus condo HOA. A little housekeeping note here, please remain muted during the entireation of the seminar and please type your questions into the chat box. Instead of muting yourself asking questions in the middle of it, save all your questions in the chat box. And also keep in mind that we're not going to answer any specific questions regarding your insurance claim. So please keep your questions general. And our guest speaker today is Mark Wu. And we have Jonathan to do our introduction to Mark. Please, Jonathan, take it away. Thank you so much. I like, I'm very, very happy to introduce Mark. He's also a fellow of my uh, brothers from Cal Poly Pomona as a fellow graduate from Cal Poly Pomona myself. So I'm very, very glad I was able to introduce Mark today. So uh, I'd like to, Mark is uh, one of the, uh, the uh, Asian uh, insurance agent that we have in the Sting Valley. It's very well notified, well um, qualified for a real estate, um, the insurance agent. So, I mean, he has, he has worked in, in industry for, at least 33 years. So he's very flu his office is very fluent in different languages. Uh, so can meet our different client needs as well. So here I'm gonna introduce you to Mark and Mark, uh, you're ready to go then. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Wu. I'm, I've been an Allstate agent for going on my 34th year. Uh, and I, I have been privileged to be a part of the board for uh, several decades. So. One of the things that uh, I was asked to do was um, speak about condo insurance and, and the requirements and all that. So um, basically, I'll start with the condo and then I'll go to homeowners so that you guys will know the difference uh, between what is and what is not covered. So anyways, the Fannie Mae loans, if there's a loan that's required, um, you know, when, when, when a, a buyer purchases a condo policy, they're going to be required not only to have a, a master policy in place, but they have to have what we call a HO6 policy in place. And how it determines what the dwelling value or the, the, the coverage on the condo policy is, is driven by the purchase price. So the, the Fannie Mae loans require that 20% of the, of the um, value of the, the sales price will has to be on the dwelling so why is a condo policy needed you know oftentimes uh, people assume that if there's a master policy then i don't need a, a, a individual ho6 uh, uh, condo policy and they what they don't realize the buyers don't realize and oftentimes even realtors is that the association policy covers only the common walk air, walkways or the common areas or elevators and um, the damages that are, are to the physical uh, property and then also the liability to the, the common areas. But the, the HO6, I'm sorry, the commercial policies, uh, master policies, they don't afford coverage to the individual unit owners. And that is why it is essential that uh, uh, a buyer of a condo obtain their own HO6 and condo policies. So what de determines whether or not it is the master policies that cover the, the coverage of the structure or the individual units owner's responsibility? You can look at condos that look exactly the same, built exactly the same, but if the CCRs define that this unit owner uh, is required to cover all his interior wall. And then the other condo that's maybe a block down the street that was built by the same builder and exactly the same floor plan, but they used a different CCNRs, they may say something different. So don't, when you go in determining whether or not it's the individual unit's owner's responsibility uh, when, when a structure is damaged, you can't go by just the eye test. You have to go right into what the CCNR policy states and the master policy, because in the insurance section, it will define what each individual owner is responsible for and what each individual owner isn't. But the perils that are normally covered under uh, uh, HO6 policy 
are things like fire, explosion, freezing, hail, uh, vehicle, meaning a vehicle comes through the house, lightning, smoke, riots, a, car, a plane coming through the house. Uh, we don't have weight of ice and snow here and sleep, but but in 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 the cold uh, cold parts of of Northern California and all that, we we have that wind storms, which we we get these Santa Ana winds and all that, and and then uh, falling objects that could be like a tree falling on top through the the individual condo owners' uh, uh, home and and vandalism and whatnot. The two that are often not covered, which are separate policies on on. Uh, not only the home, but other condo are flooding when it's surface water and also earthquake. And um, so you're some pictures of condos that you have seen. So that, that was wind damage where the wind actually pulled off the roof. Years, of, years where a tree came through and naturally everybody knows fire and fire is coverage, covered. So the first part of the condo policies that that HO6 policy is the dwelling limits. Remember, I told you guys that 20 percent, what the banks will require is 20 percent of the purchase price. So if Christine buys a condo for I mean, helps her clients buy a, a condo in Pasadena and that condo minimum is a million dollars, we're going to have to put 200,000 on the dwelling. If Christine helps somebody in Bowen Park get a $400,000 condo, we'll only have to put 80,000 in the dwelling portion. So the dwelling limit covers the fire, wind, hail, and explosion of, of something that's damaged, which the CCNR says is the, the buyer's responsibility and not the whole association's responsibility. The next coverage that that is is on a condo policy is personal uh, protection, and and this is things like like what each unit owner uh, owns. So it could be like furniture, stereo appliances, clothing, um, you know. And mostly it's it's non business related items because in business related items like like many of you are realtors and all that, if you say. I use this in real estate. Well, then you're going to be capped at more, most likely a $500 cap when it comes to that being stolen out of your condo or that being stolen out of your, your um, um, or, or a fire or a peril destroying it. Likewise, if, if um, Christine, I'm going to use you continually as an example, but if Christine is a plumber and she happens to have $10,000 worth of plumbing tools in her facilities and that gets stolen or damaged, there's gonna be a limitation to that. But if Christine happens to have that and she just happens to have a lot of tools and it happens to be um, what she uses for personal usage and not for business, then it gets thrown back into the personal property protection. Something that's very, very uh, important that the HO6 policy has and the master policy doesn't is loss of use. So again, Christine happens to be in, in the condo and she can't stay in the condo because a fire destroyed her condominium and it's going to take three or four or five months or 10 months even to rebuild. If she has an HO6 policy, it will pick up her tab up to the policy limits to put her someplace else that is similar until her condo is being rebuilt. If she doesn't have that policy, the master policy pays zero dollars. So she's going to be out of luck. So even though she may feel, hey, the association should be responsible for it. The association is going to say, yeah, we'll build back the common area structure, Christine, but we will not afford you any money to live someplace else while it's being built. So you got to move in with your, your, uh, your folks or, or a, a friend or something because there's not going to be money from the master policy. And then there's liability that, that is super, super important. Now, liability can happen in, in different forms, but one is personal liability. And as, as, it, it, as my notations alludes to, personal, personal liability covers things where there's a claim or a lawsuit resulting in bodily injury or property damage to somebody in the, the, the area that, that, I'm sorry, somebody in the complex that, um, that the buyer was responsible for or the, home, the condo unit homeowner is. So it covers the condo unit owner plus their family members and all that. So an example of this would be something where maybe Christine is, is throwing a party and she happens to be horsing around in the pool area and pushes a, 
pushes somebody into the pool because they're playing tag and whatnot, and that person cracks their head, all right? The, the master policy will, will say, hey, that wasn't the responsibility of the association. It was a result of Christine's action that caused that damage. I mean, that injury to that, that individual. So if she doesn't have a separate uh, personal li family liability policy on the HO6, then she would be afforded no protection under the master policy for that. Another example of that is she happens to have a dog bite. And I know that it's a, you know, her dogs never bit anybody. But this time, unfortunately, it bit a kid walking by. You know, if she sued there, again, the master policy would afford no coverage, but the HO6 policy would. But let's just say that she has had a she has a party and she's inviting 30 of her, her closest realtor buddies. And uh, Jonathan happens to be one of them. And and, uh, you know, Jonathan happens to choke on on some something, not not as a result of Christine's fault and all that. And they go out and they call an ambulance and the ambulance come. She can under the medical payments of the HO6 policy say, hey, I would like to take care of that. And so it's an expense of somebody that's been injured on the facility or actually inside her property. And, and she doesn't have to be negligent for them, for that, that, that payment for her to, to uh, ask her insurance company to pay for. The other thing that I want to make sure you guys knew is as soon as they go, anything happens within the complex. So within the condominium, the master policy ends as far as liability is concerned. All right. So this is, that's why we call it personal liability. So if somebody slips and falls outside on the common area, when they're walking up the driveway and all that master policy will cover it unless it was Christine's actions that caused that person to get injured. Once they enter into the complex, now it's her own policy that covers if there's, there's a negligence and, and somebody gets injured within the policy. And a, another example of that is, you know, she, maybe she has a child and the child has friends over and now the child, you know, they're horsing around and they, they, they fall down the stairs and all that. They got a broken uh, leg and whatnot. And now, you know, the, the child's uh, friends, parents sue for 30, 40, $50,000 for medical bills and pain and suffering. The HO6 policy will pick that up. All right, up to the policy limit. So that's another very important thing. So how, here's a case study where a buyer, and let's just say uh, we have XYZ realtor from West San Gabriel, and he has failed to take this class. And here's, here's something that ac actually has happened. And so he, he has a cash buyer and the cash buyer goes, Hey, Mr. Uh, XYZ Realtor from San Gabriel, do I need to get another policy or is the master policy? Okay, the, the, the Realtor XYZ says, don't worry about it, Mr. Buyer. You don't need to have a HO6 policy. You could get that later on. That is actually a true statement and you can close without that. So remember, if you have a loan, if your buyer has a loan, they have to get an HO6 policy. But if your buyer is a cash buyer, it's up to them whether or not they, they get a policy or not. So it is not, it is not re a requirement and therefore they can move on. So we go and they, they buy a policy. I mean, sorry, they, it's a five unit complex and there's um, two and a half million dollars on the master policy and there's a fire and the whole, whole five units are destroyed. If you don't think that happens, actually it did happen in my career about 10 years ago in a Glendale, um, commercial um, condo, sorry, con condo complex where the whole units burned down and uh, something like this very similar happened. But let's just say that there, it costs now two, two and a half, 2.7 million to rebuild that, that two and a half million covered policy. So there's a $200,000 shortage. How is that applied to uh, Christine as the owner of the, the, the condo, you know? that she relied on XYZ Realtors expertise to tell her, don't worry about it. She also has $75,000 worth of interior damage because remember what I told you guys, the CCNR defines what is Christine's responsibility and what is everybody's, all the other five unit members responsibility. Christine also has a bunch of fine personal belongings. You know, she has a lot of um, Chanel purses and, 
and um, stilettos and whatnot. And so her content coverage comes up to $45,000. And it's going to take 10 months to rebuild this condo. So yours, yours, what happens, first of all, from the master policy, and you might as well throw when the client that doesn't have insurance, because that's going to happen. So she experienced $75,000 worth of, of, um, of, of interior damage. These are for things like interior walls, maybe flooring, maybe uh, wood shutters, maybe cabinetry she's put in. All right. So a structure that she cannot pick up and, and, and put in a, in a moving truck to move out. So that, uh, they can be appliances and, and whatnot. And so the master policy would pay $0 to that if, if the, the CCRR said that that was Christine's responsibility. Whereas if had she had her, her HO6 policy, up to $75,000, I'm sorry, up to $120,000 would be covered for any of that structural damage. And then remember, she has $45,000 worth of personal belongings. So that would be zero coverage from the master policy. However, her HO6 policy, as long as it wasn't business um, uh, for business use, that the policy would pay up to uh, $45,000. And then, um, you know, she has a three bedroom, two bath condo, you know, in, in the city of San Gabriel. It's going to probably be, we're not going to put her up or companies can't say, you know what, Christine, just go to Motel 6. Uh, because that's what that's what we could get, pay if she has a three point I'm sorry three and a half three bedroom two and a half bath condo the companies have to give her what she is accustomed to so they will try to find a rental unit in the vicinity whether it's in San Gabriel or the surrounding community so again that ten months of of loss of use um, would be picked up and she would be paid for the her rents elsewhere because basically. The banks don't care if she had a, 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 a loan on the property, even though there's no condo and she can't live in it anymore, the banks are still going to want their, their more, more mortgage monthly uh, payments received by her. Then loss assessment. Remember, I told you guys that now it's going to cost $2.7 million to rebuild when our master policy only had $2.5 so how how is it that that two hundred thousand who who gets to pay that? Well, it's divided by each of the unit owners. So that's how loss assessments are determined. Again, that's part of the CCNRs where it defines how loss assessments are assessed. So the master policy is going to pay zero dollars, and and if she has a HO six, it will pay you know the L will pick up the forty thousand dollars because many HO six policies have about 50,000 worth of loss assessments. So you see in this, this case that I gave you where I, I the XYZ realtor said, don't worry about it. Guess who gets pretty upset when they have $190,000 worth of damage? They are gonna remember their realtor XYZ told them they didn't need to buy uh, the insurance, which was a true statement again as a, as a cash buyer. However, because, because they didn't buy it, now they have incurred 190000 And most of these policies runs between five hundred and and $1,000. So do you think that uh, who are they going to come after in the event they, they experience this kind of damage? They try, they try to sue everybody and anybody. And many times it, it goes back to the realtor. So what I always tell my, my uh, realtors in my class as, as they are in my class is to always encourage their buyers, even if they are a cash buyer, to ob obtain a HO6 policy. So never ever have any type of an email or documentation telling them that they don't need it, because that's the that's the little um, information that that their attorneys can use to bring a claim against your ENO, and you don't want to be in an ENO situation. Um, that's basically the condo in a package, Christine. I don't, I can't see if there's any questions. Are there any questions regarding condo before I go to homeowners? Mm, I don't see any uh, questions in a chat box yet, Mark. Oh, wait a anybody, minute. Anybody want to type a question in a chat box for Mark? All right, great. Can see it now. Okay. Thank you, Mark. So now we'll go to a home insurance. 
And basically a home insurance is commonly called hazard insurance or fire insurance or whatnot. And this is required again, unless you're a, a cash buyer. Now, even cash buyers know they better get home insurance. So uh, you don't get in much, much trouble when we're talking about home insurance. So what's the most common form? Uh, most, most companies across the board, the best forms they try to sell is the special form policy, which basically covers everything unless the policy says it's not covered, all right? And most companies exclude things like earthquake and flood insurance, all right? Um, but contents are covered under uh, a name peril basis, and, and that is where they'll name what kind of perils that, that uh, has to happen to the contents in order for there to be coverage. Again, these are the common, just like the condo, it's, it's very similar in, in coverages when the, your, your, your home is damaged, the structure is damaged, it'll cover fire, explosion, wind, hail, smoke, explosion, falling objects, and what such, whatnot. Here's where it's a little different in that the dwelling coverage A is your most essential coverage in a homeowner policy. And these are, are things that are, are, are part of your house. Um, actual house that you live in. So there are attached structures to your house and like things like built-in appliances, uh, plumbing, heating that are permanently uh, installed. So if the garage is attached to the house, it falls under the dwelling coverage. If it's not attached to the house or detached, then it falls under other structures. So what I normally tell my clients and my realtor um, friends is that if you're walking up on the roof where the main part of the house is and you can continue to walk on the roof, everything under that roof is normally under a dwelling coverage. If, if there's a gap and you have to jump, come back down and go back up, then that part of the roof, that top part of the structure is other structures. So normally you'll have amount of dwelling coverage and each company determines, they have their formulas to determine what they are comfortable with to replace the house that, that your buyers build. But oftentimes other structure is part of the policy. And what most companies do is put only 10% of their dwelling amount. So using the example of Christine buying a house in San Gabriel, if the house is a, hundred, a million dollar home, we're gonna put $100,000 on the person, I mean, on the other structures, all right? So that's what she will have. So let's just say actually she, she was able to buy a great deal and she was able to buy a $500,000 home and she only has $50,000 worth of other structures. Well, if there happens to be an ADU or a, or, or a gazebo or a pool or whatnot, if the insurance agent isn't told about these things, you know, then we won't have enough money to, to um, rebuild. That's why it's really important if, if you know that there's a lot of high value of, of patios and retaining walls and sidewalks and, and even a detached garage that, that the insurance agent, a conversation with the, the buyer has to have a conversation with the insurance agent to bump up those, those amounts so that there's sufficient enough um, uh, insurance to rebuild. The thing that 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 homeowner policy covers is that it will cover the personal belongings. So if you remember the the furniture, stereo, appliances, clothing, and whatnot, you know um, what most people are moving into the house is most likely going to be covered under personal contents. Now know that there are limitations when it comes to theft. So if Christine owns jewelry and she owns tens of thousand and up to like 50, 60, 70,000. As long as it's under the policy limits and it's a, one of those perils that causes the damages, she will be fully restored for those. However, if it's an event of a theft, many companies put a limitation on, on jewelry and artwork, fine arts and whatnot on theft. So uh, additional endorsement has to be made. So she might only be covered for $2,000 or $5,000 of the whole theft loss. And you know, theft tends to be a very big item these days and whatnot. So it's super important for, uh, for the buyer to have a conversation with their, their insurance agent if they have many items that are of, of great value. Because things like jewelry needs to be endorsed for theft or mysterious disappearance. And again, 
business property is something that will be limited. Uh, the example I use about Christine being a plumber, if she has $10,000 worth of tools in the house and they get stolen, she is probably only going to be afforded $500 from her, her uh, home insurance coverage, doesn't matter what company she's with. However, if if uh, they're, they're her personal belongings, then all of that would be covered as long as it's under the limits of the, the policy. One of the things that are really important also in personal property is that many companies have what we call a replacement cost endorsement. So Christine has bought a, a computer or a TV set, let's say a TV set, it's a little easier, and it's a big screen TV set, and it costs $5,000 five years ago. Well, if she doesn't have replacement cost endorsement on, on her coverage, then what the companies do is we'll say, well, what's a depreciated cost of that TV set in five years? And they'll pay her uh, a percentage of that. So let's say she paid $5,000 for that TV set five years ago, and now the market value for a used TV is $2,000. That's what she's going to get. She's going to get actual cash value. However, if she has a replacement cost endorsement on the policy, the companies will go out and buy her that TV set, even if it now costs $7,000, so more than what she paid for it, all right? That goes for things like clothing as well. You know, you have a lot of good clothing. What's used clothing going to be? If you don't have replacement costs, you're going to get pennies on the dollars. But if you have new clothes, I mean, if you have the replacement cost endorsement on your policy, you are going to get reimbursed uh, a new for old if it's, if it's destroyed due to a covered peril. And again, we talked about lost use, same happens here. She has now a 5,000 square feet home in San Gabriel and the house burns down, all right? And it takes, you know, 12 months to rebuild. If she has loss of use, many companies will pay for her to be in a 5,000 square feet home um, while the house is being rebuilt. So as long as the house is destroyed and she can't live in it, even if part of the house is destroyed and she can't live in it, the companies will pay for that, her to be put someplace else that she's accustomed to. So they won't just put her again in a Motel 6. They cannot do that. They have to put her in something that, that she normally is accustomed to. Um, we talked about liability and the same liability even more applies here because now when somebody gets injured on your property, it is all you. There's not common area. So things like dog bites, things like, um, you know, where, where um, she's spraying off the driveway and somebody slips and falls, or, or maybe now there's cracks in her driveway and uneven uh, walkways and whatnot. Um, li family liability protection covers that. Some people don't also realize that when you guys are playing, whether it's golf, baseball, or tennis, you know, and you happen to injure somebody off premises, that is actually covered under family, family liability as long as it was a, not an intentional act. So if Christine is not actually taking her racket and, and hitting Jonathan because she's angry at him, it would be covered if it was accidental, you know, up to the policy limits. Okay. Another thing that people don't realize is even many of us uh, fly and many of us try to save the baggage fees on, on uh, airplanes now. So we we stuff our, our uh, carry-ons to the limits and oftentimes they're pretty heavy. Well, if one of those, those carry-ons uh, falls on, on somebody's head, on another passenger's head, believe it or not, your homeowner liability affords coverage for that. So pretty neat, neat coverage. Um, and then we talked about the medical payments. That's where you have an invited member. They're not really suing you. You're not negligent to any degree. They just happen to get injured on the property. Many policies pay one, two to five thousand dollars for their medical expenses, and that can be evoked by a request. So this is um, what, one of the things that I wanted to make sure is not all insurance policies are alike, and so it's super, super important for you guys to know that that uh, if you get coverages and quotes from company A, company F, company S, CFP, and they all quote six hundred thousand. Our natural tendency, especially for those of us are, who are Asians, is that, hey, I like the best price, right? And so uh, I, I want that $900 policy because everybody is, is covering me for 600000 
well, how's that going to get you guys in an ENO claim? And I'm going to show you where you will be in an ENO claim. So note that the least expensive is not the best. Remember that their home is probably going to be their biggest asset th that most individuals will purchase in their lifetime. And so we have to provide adequate protection. So it's, it's, it's not a good time for us to get all chintzy with, with uh, coverages and all that, because, um, you know, you don't want your clients to, to get in a position where something has happened and now they don't have the right coverages and you were the one that instructed them, hey, go with this policy. And if there's any documentation to that fact, you get pulled into an ENO claim. So my, my job when I'm doing my training is to make sure that, that those who attend my class adequately not only know about their own policies, but know how to help their buyers. So let's just say that the house rebuilding cost is 875,000. You might wanna say, Mark, how could that possibly be? Well, in order for companies to get an actual replacement cost on your home, they would have to get a bid from an electrician, uh, an architect, a, a, a framer, a window installer, a plumber, um, a HVAC and all that. But nobody in their right, no contractor will be willing to give out a bid if they know no work is, is ha to be had. So what companies do is they have a, just a general estimate. And then most companies have what we call extended limits. All right. What extended limits are is the amount of insurance these companies are willing to put beyond what they're insuring your house for. So a specified limit policy would be what you see is what you get. That's like the CN, CFP. That company I can name because I represent them as well. California Fair Plan. This is a company of last resort. Many times we put these up on, on the foothills brush area because most companies don't want to insure that way. So if you have 600,000, they're not going to pay a penny over 600,000. All right. Some companies do 25%. Some companies do 50. Some companies do... Uh, uh, 20%. So again, going on this 875,000, right now, billing costs are through the roof. In fact, most bids, if you're building a house right now, are only good for maybe two weeks, but maximum 30 days, because the builders all know that their material costs and their, their cost to move, move the product to the, 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 the site is increasing, you know, weekly. Uh, and so that's why you can have the cost of the home way more than what you insured the home for. Another thing that happens is if you guys remember when we had the fires a couple of years ago, where um, I, I think, gosh, I, it was like Pleasantville up north, um, the whole community burned down, like all the houses burned down, not just one house. So when the demand is high, guess who they're going to? So if if Jonathan's company is telling me they're they're only paying me a certain amount, but Christine's policy company says, hey, we're willing to pay the 50% of more if because this is where your house is coming. I, as a contractor, am going to go to whoever is paying me the most for my services because everybody wants my services and I can't build everybody's house. So that's how costs also go up. So if demand's high or supply on material costs is low and demand is high or, or the, the transportation costs is high, that all can increase the cost of rebuilding. And so, um, so how does that happen? Well, if I have company A, you know, even though I purchased $600,000, I basically have 1.5 times that 600,000. So the policy I have will pay a maximum of $900,000. All right. If I have company B or F, that company pays up to 1.25. So that will maximum will go up to 750,000. And if I have company C, it goes up 20% to 720. And then again, California Fair Plan only pays a specified limit of 600,000. So if you look at the line at the very beginning, bottom, sorry, you could see that my out-of-pocket expense for company A was $0 out of my pocket or Christine's pocket because this is her house she, she rebuilt. So do you think that that $95 difference every year that she had to pay is going to come up in her head? Or is she going to say, man, I'm glad I paid that $95 because it basically covered the whole rebuilding and I didn't have to pay anything other than my deductible out of my pocket. 
Had she gone with company F, however, Christine might be a little bit upset because she goes, hey, she saved 50 bucks on the cheapest policy, but now she got to come up with 125,000 because, and how you got that is, um, actually, I think I did a calculation here. Let's see. No, it is correct. I'm sorry. That her policy will pay up to $750,000, but our house costs eight seventy five dollars to rebuild. So they're going to take, the, her contractors are going to ask her to pay $125,000 out of her pocket because the, comp, the insurance company is only going to pay her, uh, them $750,000 to rebuild. Likewise, in company S, they're only going to pay a maximum of, of $720,000. So now it's even worse. She only saved $25 bucks from the cheapest policy, but her out-of-pocket is $155,000. And then, of course, if they went to the very cheapest policy, that that Christina is going to be super upset at me as XYZ Realtor because I I, I told her to go with that policy because it was the cheapest. But now she has to pay pull out two hundred and seventy five thousand out of her own pocket. So again, this is you know something that that probably I I always emphasize when I'm doing my classes with with Realtors. Is and and even if you you're your own uh, um, you own your own home, go back to your 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 insurance agents and ask them, hey, what's the maximum my policy will be willing to pay? So don't worry about the percentage, but here's your five key questions you want to ask. All right, is if something happens in the event of a covered loss, what is the maximum my policy will pay? And then use that number and divide by your square footage and see if that is a, a sufficient amount so that in the event that your, your rebuilding cost is more than what your covered amount is, meaning what's shown on your policy, you know, at least you know the padding difference that your policy will, will, will provide you, all right? The second important question that, that you want to ask is in the event of a personal loss, you know, to my personal belongings, Will, you, will your policy have replacement costs, meaning will I get new for old or will you depreciate Miss uh, insurance company and only give me whatever the farm market value is in today's market, you know? So my computer gets stolen. Am I going to get pennies on the dollar or am, am I going to get a brand new computer? If my furniture and appliances get stolen or my artwork, am I going to get new versus old? So replacement costs is the second item. Then the, the third one, you want to make sure you have liability on your policies. Now, most policies do have liability, but no, please note the fair plan does not have liability as part of the, the package. So if they bought the cheapest fair plan policy and somebody gets injured in the premises, whether it's through a dog bites, uh, um, you know, or slip and fall or whatnot, zero dollars is going to be paid out. Most policies come with 100000 in liability. And, and can be raised to up to a million. I actually recommend a half a million, $500,000 policy when it comes to liability as part of the homeowner package because we're in a sue happy state. Everything, everybody wants to sue. There's a lot of lawyers. And so, um, you know, people want, they may tell you that, that they're not gonna sue you. And then a couple of weeks down the road, it happens. I've seen it time and time again. I've personally experienced it. Um, where somebody said, don't worry about it, I'm okay and all that. And then all of a sudden a month later, I get a letter from my attorney wanting, you know, for pain and suffering, so. And then another important thing is, does my policy cover for building code upgrades requires by my city uh, planning commission? What this is, is that if your house is burned down, most policies say that they will pay for like quality, like material and put back into the, the position that, that your, your house was in prior to the claim. However, the cities don't allow you to do that because codes are changing all the time. They may say, hey, your, your windows are, are not energy efficient. Now you gotta put in energy efficient windows or your, your electrical outlets are, you don't have enough because before you only have one a room. Now we require every six feet, you, we need one or whatnot or, or um, Maybe, maybe the, the type of wooding or the beam or the reinforcement, that adds cost to your home. And so if you have, do not have billing code upgrades, then you have to pay that out of your pockets and you have to pay the difference. However, if you have billing code upgrades on your homeowner policy, 
then it will pay for the code change code upgrades that the cities require. All right. And then, of course, the, the other important thing is, does it provide funds for any additional living expenses? Again, you know, Christine had a 5,000 square foot home. It burns down. She can't stay in it for 12 months. Will the policy pay for her to be put up someplace else? Or will they say, tough luck, Christine, go, go live with a friend? So that is that if, if you guys just take these five questions and, and forget everything else that I, I told you, you, you will be well situated to understand what a normal homeowner policy uh, covers and that can assist you. One of the things that, that um, I would like to also just um, make sure you guys know is don't get involved in a situation where you know the person is buying a home, your buyers are buying a home, they got a home loan, but they are not getting, and, and, and they're asking for home insurance, but they know they're renting it out. That, guy's, that can get you guys involved in an e and because if, if I have a homeowner policy and Christine gets a homeowner policy from me and she knows that there's a, a tenant that she's going to be renting out because it's technically an investment property, many companies can deny coverage because a, a correct policy is not involved. Also, there's another thing called loss of income. Let's say that, that Christine has that 5,000 square foot home and she's renting it out for 6,000 a month in San Gabriel, right? In 10 months, right, or 12 months, that's a loss of 72,000 in income, correct? If she has a home insurance and not a landlord's policy, she's not gonna get that $72,000 back from the insurance company for the loss of income that that she lost due to the house being burned down. So had she had a landlord policy, we would ab absolutely cover the loss of income that she, she realized as a result of the house being burned down. So correct policy gets, you know, uh, is the best practice and allow the client to have the conversation with the agent. So one of the things that, that I always preface in my, my 34 years of business is always telling my realtor friends, you know what, get somebody that's knowledgeable and part of your team and has good ethics and all that and have them whether, you know, as part of your insurance team so that in the event that your clients ask you personal questions regarding um, insurance coverages, you're not the one that's saying is, and you could say, you know what, that's a very good question, Mr. Buyer. I have XYZ agent or Mark as part of my team and I'll, I'll let Mark answer that question. Here's his, his contact number, and or I'll, I'll have Mark contact you and explain that. This is a way that you guys could get yourself out of a, a ENO because um, you know many insurance agents, or hopefully many insurance agents, have ENO themselves to protect you and your clients in the event that they say something inaccurate regarding coverage. Because if we say, if I or my staff says something is covered and it's not, Guess what? It's covered because my ENO will pay for it. So, anyways, that's my spiel. And um, if there's any questions, we will. Um... All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we do have a few questions. We have one that's that was sent directly to me from Frankie. His question is: When the when the big tree, uh, next door neighbor's big tree falls onto my house and damages my house roof, which insurance company should I claim? Do I go through my own insurance company or my next door neighbor's insurance company? That is an excellent question, Frankie, and this comes up uh, a lot. We experience a couple of uh, Santa Ana winds that are big enough to topple trees. Um, and actually, if some of you guys were around in Arcadia about five years ago, it, it was like a natural disaster everywhere you went in Arcadia, Temple City and, and whatnot. So that, that's the, the answer to that is two parts. One is, let's just say that the tree is not diseased, all right? And it's a windstorm and whatnot. So my tree falls on top of Christine's house and it, it, it destroys her kitchen and whatnot, all right? It's actually Christine's own policy that she has to put a claim on, even though it's my tree that caused the damage. Now, here's where it, it, she can come after me and my liability um, and my insurance policy. Let's say that she has said, she has put me on notice and said, Mark, I am concerned about this tree that's in your yard. 
and I can see that it's a disease and whatnot, or, or you trimmed it back and you cut off the branches off your side and now it's leaning towards me. In that event, then it's my liability that will have to um, um, pay Christine to fix her house if my tree falls down. Or if I'm chopping the tree down and it happens to fall in Christine's home, then it is gonna be on my policy because it was my neg negligence that, that caused the damage to Christine. Oh, got it. So then the responsibility determines whose insurance company to claim, basically, right? Yeah, and what happened. So uh, just an just, uh, act of God and my tree falling on top of your house and causing damage, whether it's to your car or to your home, even though it's my tree, mm -hmm. it's up to, it's, that's going to be on your, your own home insurance and your home uh, auto insurance policy. Gotcha. Thank you so much. And there's another question for Frankie. When the apartment is, is were under rebuilt after fire, does the fire insurance cover loss of income during construction? If they, yes, if they have that on a part of the policy. So if the, the unit, the, the investor has loss of income, then, then they will cover. So yeah, let's say it's a 10 unit apartment complex and due to smoke damage, all 10 units are, are being rebuilt for up to 10 months. And he's getting fifteen hundred each each unit, you know. So fifteen hundred times ten times uh, ten, that's what the insurance company would pay for loss of income. Great. Um, another question, Frankie. Uh, what do you mean by replacement guarantee that you mentioned earlier in your presentation? All right. There's replacement costs and replacement guarantee. Not many companies out there. In fact, hardly any do guarantees anymore. That was done away with back in '96. Uh, and so forth. So your major three companies don't have guarantee. Guarantee means it doesn't matter what it will cost to rebuild, they will replace it to, to the maximum amount. So if I insured your house for 500,000 and it costs 5 million to rebuild, company, if, if I gave you that clause, we would rebuild it for $5 million. However, companies have co since come back and done what we call extended limits. That's the 50%, 25%, 20%. Extended limits, so they put a cap on it now. So mm, what yeah. we do is call it replacement costs with extended limits. Got it. Thank you, Mark. Um, question from Tracy. Hi, Mark. Could you please cover renters' insurance? Thank you. Absolutely. So people always ask me, should I require renters' or insurance or not? And I tell in my classes, I advise you're crazy if you do not uh, inform your, your, your um, investors to require renter's insurance. Now, legally, I don't know if that can happen. Um, and, you know, it's up to each individual, but renter's insurance protects you in many ways. Let's, using Christine as an example, she is renting my home, all right? And Christine's one of those that, ooh, loves those scented candles and fragrance and all that. But because Christine works a lot, she tends to fall asleep and and she's kind of like a wild sleeper. So one day she even knocks down the, the scent of candle and knocks the candle out. And now there's 25,000 in smoke damage. Believe it or not, we could go after uh, her renter's insurance for that as long as she has liability up to $100,000. Another situation I had like early on in my career was I had a client that had required renters, I'm sorry, had renters insurance or, or for their, um, let me back up, had a dog that bit somebody. And what happened was in his, in his uh, rental agreement, he said, no dogs allowed. So he brought that, but what the, what the attorney of the, the, the renter said was made him on the stand say, do you come and do you do inspections? And did you ever see the dog on the property? And because he did, that's how it came back to him and, and he was liable. And, and so there was litigation costs. So, so renters had the, the renter had renter's insurance, it wouldn't have come even to my owner's, um, uh, you know, the, the liability claim for the dog bite wouldn't have even come to the, the owner. The other thing the renter's insurance policy does is, let's just say uh, Christine is a fabulous tenant, right? And it's hard to find somebody. She's been a 10-year tenant. She continues to pay. She never calls me for any um, maintenance issue because she takes care of it herself. If she happens to have a, a, a loss where she can't stay in the, 
the the resident for you know a, a month or two i don't want her to go out looking for a place to stay and now she likes that place better and all that a renter's policy will do loss of use so we'll pay christine to to stay someplace else she still has to pay me you know what she normally pays me but she doesn't have to have any additional cost out of our pocket to stay someplace else. So that is something also renters insurance covers. Now, the, the thing that as a landlord, you really don't you know, care about, but, but renters insurance covers the personal belonging of the renters. So at least what that aspect, what that does is it prevents the tenant from saying, hey, you're, you know, your pipe bursted and it ruined my furniture and clothing. So, so I want you to pay for all my furniture and, and, and clothing. You know, you're not legally technically obligated for that unless you specifically cause that negligence, but you don't need to be in that fight. So if the person has renter's insurance, at least renter's insurance would uh, provide protection for that. Thank you, Mark. A uh, question from Judy. The question on condo master insurance that has wall in coverage. Does the buyer still need to purchase HO6? How are the, how is it usually the master wall in coverage versus the HOA6 makes the HOA6 needed? Okay. Makes sense. Yeah, Judy has been waiting a couple of months for this. In fact, she proposed that I, I throw this, this uh, class in. So thank you, Judy, for that question. So again, remember what I told you, even if the master policy provides wall in coverage, what oftentimes the CCNR will do is say they only provide it for the original structure. So Christina is one of those that likes modern things, but she's in a She's in a non-modern type of condo. And so she goes and she replaces all the wall coverings. She replaces all the granite countertops and all that and whatnot. Maybe that costs $30,000, $40,000. Once she makes a change to what was originally there, many CCNR say it's the responsibility of, of the unit owner. And that's why you need an HO6 to, to step in and provide that coverage. But even if the condo master policy has wall in coverage. You guys remember the, the couple major things I talked to you guys about condo policy. You know, let's just say that, that I'm not worried about, or Christine's not worried about any of the structure that happens. Well, she's still like ex exposed due to her personal belongings because a, a ma master policy will not cover any of your contents. She's still uh, exposed to personal liability, meaning slip and falls, her dog biting somebody, her negligence where she happens to be hosing off her driveway and the neighbor slips and falls, you know, they're going to go after her, not the association, even though it happened on common area or the pool party where her child is horse playing there in, in the pool and happens to injure her friend, classmate, happened in common area, but the master policy attorney is going to uh, deny that claim because it, it wasn't, it wasn't resulting in the, the, common area uh, or the people's negligence it was christine's son that that caused the injury and then we talked about loss of use right takes 10 months to rebuild three thousand dollars to have a three bedroom two bath in in san gabriel to live someplace else master policy is going to pay zero dollars where if she has a ho6 policy it's going to pick up that tab so if the question if you guys can't remember anything XYZ client says, do I need an HO6 policy? I hope you guys all type in. The answer is, yes, you do. Speak to my, speak to Mark. He's part of our team. He can provide that proposal. All right. Thank you, that Mark. That gets you out of any litigation. <laughs> For sure. HOA6, renter's uh, policy? Yes. Is that very important? Let them, let them talk to the insurance agent and say they don't want it. Then, then you're, you're free from any problems. Thank you. Anybody, anybody has any questions? I think those are the questions we have so far, but I do have a question. Oh, actually, we do have one that popped up. Weiming, how, how do claims adjuster determine cost of repairs? They have a detailed description of the task required. Uh, most of them are reasonable. Can I meet with them on items that are more, more costly to repair in view of the current in inflationary pressure? Oh, Weiming is a contractor, so. This is about determining the cost of repairs. Most companies have uh, what, what cost of repairs are plus or minus, and they can often tell when a contractor 
is trying to take them to the cleaners and whatnot. So as long as it's documented and justify, all claims can be admitted and, and, and reassessed and whatnot. So um, it's just the burden of proof is up to the contractor to show that, that he is, he is um, you know, forthright and that this is what the current market exposure has. Remember, all the policies are factored in as long as they have replacement costs, extended limits for, for us to be able to absorb those, those, those uh, cost increases due to whether or not uh, the, the material costs have gone high or inflation, so. Gotcha, thank you, Mark. Um, I do have a question personally. So I do live in a condo, so you're a mind reader, three bedroom, two and a half baths. So my master policy does not have earthquake insurance. Would it make sense for me to purchase my own earthquake insurance? Because if the structure does get damaged, it's the whole entire structure. And, and you're right. So that, that's the one of the unfortunate things of having a condo, uh, living in a condo complex, because un, unless the association um, wants condo, pol, you know, gets the earthquake insurance, you're going to be out, out of luck. You can't kick and scream, but it doesn't matter. The, the board has to vote. The whole complex has to vote for that. So does it, as, as a realtor and even as an agent, you always say, yes, I encourage you to buy it then you got to decide whether or not it's it's worthwhile because there are certain things that the the earthquake condo policy covers personally it covers your personal um walls that that you're a for you, you know you're responsible for but that's going to be 20 30 40 50 thousand dollars and at, frankly if the structure isn't there you can't build that so all right, right. But if you handle your personal belongings it's also going to be put you up someplace else so on the whole, you know, it's it it's not that much value from a standpoint because the master policy doesn't have it. Gotcha. Thank you so much, Mark, for your time and sharing your valuable knowledge with us. Um, thank you so much for coming. Any other questions before we let Mark go? No? Okay. Thank you so much. Everybody's saying thank you, Mark. <laughs> That's all right. For answering our Good questions. Hands. Have a fabulous week, everyone. Take care. And then I'll Give it back to Jonathan to close up the seminar for us today. This is actually a quite interesting uh, topic. It's very nicely presented, Mark. Thank you so much. And thank you for giving us all the precious information. I think a lot of the realtors will, will, will know more about insurance now and know how to advise our clients. And then hopefully we'll go to you for more answer then. Yeah. Thank you so much. Anyway, I mean, this is a very good, important classes for us. Uh, West St. Vincent Association of does provide a lot of different trainings. And this is one of the good trainings that we have. In the future, we will be having more uh, training as well. So just want to make sure that all of us go check out the education schedule in the West St. Vincent website. Uh, there is a lot of important training classes available. So I, I hope that everybody attend the different classes. Well, there is one that's coming up that's very important, which is the realtor branding, which is coming up shortly. Uh, something that you might want to consider taking it and understanding what the NAR CR is providing an uh, individual realtor. And also I noticed that Tony Watson is coming in again on May 11 at 11 o'clock to do another commercial training. So that's a very good classes to attend to uh, you definitely can learn a lot from uh, Tony. All right, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. You guys all have a good day. Bye-bye.